people across the country are already experiencing will worsen as warming increases and new risks will emerge. Joining me now to talk about it all is Dr. Kim Cobb. She is the director of the Institute at Brown for Environment and Society. Appreciate you joining us. Um, so, first of all, President Biden is going to be heading to the G20 in Bali for a face-to-face -face meeting with Chinese leader Xi Jinping Monday. All eyes are on this meeting because, as we know, um, you know, tensions are quite high, and China and the U.S. Uh, need each other when it comes to working together on combating climate change. How important is their cooperation? Well, it's critical at this stage that everybody look for what we can do uh, individually as well as on the global stage to combat rising emissions. Um, the U.S. has brought a lot to the table this year with the summer passage of the Inflation Reduction Act under the Biden administration, uh, poised to bring our emissions down 40 percent by 2030. Uh, you know, not enough to reach that 50 percent reduction by 2030 uh, to limit warming to that 1.5 degrees Celsius. Uh, but just yesterday at COP27, the Biden administration uh, saying that they were doubling down on their efforts to combat rising methane emissions in this country uh, with pledges to reduce methane emissions, of course, a potent greenhouse gas, by as much as 80 per 87 percent by 2030. So bringing a lot to the table, but obviously looking for a leadership role because the U.S. can't do this alone. We're going to have to inspire other countries to come with us on this path uh, to reduce emissions uh, dramatically this decade. How much influence do you think Biden has on the global stage when it comes to to urging nations to, to, to do something? I mean, is America back when it comes to leadership in that? Well, I, I definitely hope so. Obviously, we've had a vacuum of leadership for several years now, uh, this administration seeking a global leadership role. Um, however, the path ahead is daunting. The Global Carbon Project releasing their new estimates for 2022 emissions globally, ticking up by 1% on 2021 emission levels the wrong direction. So what we need to do is think about how we can come together uh, as uh, international partners to bring that curve down and start turning it around to achieve those 50% reductions by 2030. Obviously, the U.S. has an important role. Our emissions last year as a country ticked up as much as 1.5%. So this really speaks to the need for very near-term action. But it also reminds us that international agreements are only part of the solution here. We have national level pledges, state level pledges, local pledges as well that are going to have to come together uh, to look at what can be done over these next precious years of emissions reductions action. You know, the U.N. climate summit after summit, uh, we, you know, we hear about this very dangerous threshold of uh, 1.5 degrees Celsius. Uh, the global average temperature yeah. has already risen around 1.2 degrees Celsius since yeah. the Industrial Revolution. Is this something that's reversible? I, I, you know, I feel like a lot of um, pessimists would say it almost sounds inevitable that we're going to get to 1.5. Well, we're, we're fighting to keep warming to 1.5 right now, and, and that is the most ambitious target that's on the table. So, in fact, that is correct. Uh, but we do know that every increment of warming is connected with any host of increasing and worsening climate and weather extremes now. This is outlined in detail in the National Climate Assessment Draft that just dropped this week as well, connecting the dots for what this means for our country. And I note, of course, that the tally for climate and weather extremes in this country is in the hundreds of billions of dollars of damages per year as compiled by the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration. So this is something that is already costing our economy and we need to get to work while we keep communities safe from the damages that are expecting over the next few decades of continued warming. And when it comes to potential agreements from COP27, I mean, how does the energy crisis in Europe complicate things, especially now that we're seeing, you know, Europe turning to coal again because of the Russian gas supply? Supply, uh, you know, decreasing significantly. Does this mean we're going to take a huge step back? 
Well, I think it is a reminder of how important it is to accelerate this transition away from fossil fuels and the dependency on, on economic systems and geopolitical tensions that they are associated with. If we had been closer to achieving our renewable energy goals uh, in the last five years, we wouldn't be having uh, this kind of energy crisis in Europe right now. So that's one reminder. But obviously, we're going to be reeling through a large-scale global energy crisis for some time in the future. Big decisions ahead. Are we going to use this opportunity to accelerate our transition away from fossil fuels uh, towards low-carbon energy sources, or are we going to double down on fossil fuels in this most critical moment of our fight against global warming? Dr. King Cobb uh, with uh, Brown University. Thank you so much, Kim. Thanks for having me. Still ahead.